Hey guys, my name is Terry. I am co-founder and co-owner of Rodown Original, and I am also a U.S. Army National Guard veteran. And uh, I'm also a recipient of the Purple Heart, and this is my story on how I received my Purple Heart. Uh, basically, in 2009, I deployed with the Connecticut Army National Guard to Afghanistan. I was with the infantry, and as an infantryman, our job was to find and engage the Taliban. Uh, about six months into our deployment, we had already been, we already received a lot of heavy contact. We, as a company, we survived ambushes, mortar attacks, small arms fire, IEDs, and suicide bombers. So, um, by six months, uh, yeah, we were just pretty busy. Around that time, it was my turn to take leave uh, for R&R. &R. Um, basically, soldiers are allowed two weeks leave um, from their deployment. Uh, just two weeks to get away from the war, go back home, visit their family, friends, and loved ones and all that. And I decided I wanted to go to Peru. I wanted to go visit Machu Picchu and uh, I came across a nonprofit called Global Tears where people were able to volunteer at an orphanage and teach underprivileged kids English and essentially be a big brother. And I thought that was a great idea. That's where I wanted to go and that's where I booked my tickets for leave. So it was the day following my 24th birthday. I just turned 24. Uh, my birthday is July 2nd, and it was also my last mission before I leave. And uh, I'm generally a really optimistic person. I like to focus on the positive things, except on this day, it's, it felt like Murphy's Law. I felt like everything was too good to be true. Um, and I just had this really bad feeling that something bad was gonna happen. I just couldn't shake it. I just had this, all this anxiety building up inside of me. And I literally said out loud, yep, I'm gonna die. So we went on a mission for, um, we went on a mission to do a KLE, which is a key leader engagement. Essentially, our leader talks to their leader and as we went to a village to conduct the KLE, uh, we heard some small arms fire. Basically, it was, the, it was our Afghan counterparts shooting at what they believed would be ter uh, the Taliban setting up for uh, an attack. And it was a really short engagement. And after that, I was like, yeah, <laughs> that was it. You know, all that anxiety I had built up was for nothing. And so I was really pumped that day. Um, I was really excited that it was a short mission. I was excited that all the anxiety was over nothing. I mean, after, you know, have some heavy contact, the smallest fire really was nothing to us. So as we were patrolling back to the base, uh, in the truest sense of the unexpected, as if you were driving on the highway and all your glass, all the windows and cars shattered, we were, we were caught in an unexpected ambush. My squad was in the kill zone, and I, uh, I know that because one of my teammates had told us months after uh, the ambush that he saw an arm swing out over a cliff holding an AK and, and um, essentially spraying and praying. And after uh, that person was started shooting at us, uh, we started receiving um, machine gun fire from all around us in the valley. And so everybody started running for cover. I jumped off the road. We were on a road patrolling back to the base alongside of a mountain. Um, I landed in a ditch and as I looked around, I tried to identify where the shooting was coming from. I couldn't see the shooter, so I told my buddy to cover me while I bounded up the mountain in order to get um, a recon by fire. I was a light machine gunner and my job is to suppress heavy fire. That way my, uh, my guys can maneuver and try to gain some superiority over over um, the enemy. Um, I remember I wasn't trying to be Rambo. I wasn't trying to be a hero. I was just trying to do my job and I was trying to maneuver towards the fire and try to pinpoint where the enemy was so I could lay down some rounds. I remember as soon as I got up to the mountain, I realized I was way, 
I was way further from my guys than I should have been. The moment I, re I, I realized how far I was, I knew I needed to turn back. They started shooting at me and I ducked for cover immediately uh, at the smallest, ro at the nearest rock I could find. It was a really small rock. It was just big enough for me to cover my body if, when, as long as I tucked my head between my knees. So I stayed there and as I listened to the gunfire, I couldn't hear the rounds above me. Normally when you're getting shot at and they're, um, they're getting really accurate, uh, you can hear the rounds whizzing past your head. And if you're around, if you're around concrete or a bunch of rocks, the, the bullets will, will land on the rocks near you and it'll, hear like, it'll sound like crackling of like open electric wires. But I couldn't hear the rounds whizzing and I knew that they couldn't, they weren't really shooting close to me, they couldn't find me. So uh, I popped up on my, and I got on my right knee and I started shooting at them. They stopped shooting and then they quickly responded with their own burst of rounds. I, uh, I, I tucked my head back down and I shot another burst myself. So I felt like the Wild West. I felt like, you know, just two people shooting at each other back and forth. And suddenly I was hit with the most excruciating pain in my entire life. It felt like someone took one of those uh, fireplace pokers and just skewered my leg from my left cheek all the way into my thigh. And immediately after skewering me with that poker, it felt like someone reached into my thigh and was shredding my muscles with their bare hand. Um, the pain was so intense. I didn't scream. I didn't shout. I just... I tried my best to deal with the pain. It, it, all, it just took over my mind. Um, we've all stubbed our toe. And, you know, you, when you stub your toe, uh, and that pain shoots up your foot. You just freeze in place. You kind of like hold in your breath and you, you just uh, wait for the pain to subside. That's, that's how I felt with m my body. My entire body was flexing and flinching, just trying to survive the pain. It, I just kept, I remember just laying on the ground, my uh, lower back arched, clawing and gripping the earth. And uh, eventually my body just gave out, it collapsed. It was, um, it gave out on its own, kind of like when you do push-ups until failure. And uh, eventually um, my mind came to and my eyes started focusing on whatever I was looking at. And I could see the trail that had led me up the mountain and I realized that I was shot. And uh, I knew I needed to get back down that mountain and get closer to my guys, but there was just no way I was gonna be able to low crawl down this mountain. So I shouted for my teammate who last saw me. I shouted his name and um, my voice was drowned out by all the shooting going on. So I waited for maybe about 30 seconds. I tried to wait for a lull, but still, uh, we're in this valley and there's machine guns going off from every direction. My guy shooting, the enemy shooting. But I tried shouting my, uh, I tried shouting for my teammate again, uh, and no response. Uh, he can't hear me. So I lay there and at this point, I'm wondering how far the enemy is who shot me. I'm wondering if he's gonna run up and finish me off. I just, I play these scenarios in my mind of um, someone just coming up and ripping into my skin with 7.62 rounds. And um, I, uh, I just wait there not knowing what to do. So, I was raised in the church and I began to pray. Um, my parents are Christians before I was even born. So I, I laid there praying to God and um, I wasn't expecting, I wasn't trying to trick myself into believe something like an angel to come out of the sky or some sort of mystery soldier to come out of nowhere and just carry me the way to safety. But I was just casting out my faith and hope in God that um, he was gonna do something to send me a sign that I was gonna be okay. But nothing changed. Um, the shooting continued. Uh, there was a sound of helicopters in the air. I didn't hear anybody shout for my name. And uh, I slowly started realizing that 
I was gonna die. So I made myself as comfortable as possible laying there on the ground. I just kept staring at the sky and uh, I waited for either a miracle or for death. And um, as I lay there waiting, I kept looking at the sky. It was so blue, and it was so beautiful. And it looked like it was picture perfect, as if it could be one of those photos on a desktop computer. It just seemed way too happy. It just seemed so happy while I was laying there dying. And I got really pissed off. I, I just went absolutely postal. I, I was. I think I was pissed at God. I think I, I really, I know I was pissed at myself for accepting the fact that I thought I was gonna die. And I, I literally screamed out loud, fuck dying in Afghanistan. I am not fucking dying here. So without even thinking of it, um, I grabbed a machine gun, I put it on safe, I dug the barrel into the earth and I pushed myself over the cliff and I landed in a matter of seconds. I landed a switchback beneath me, uh, maybe five or six feet. And without even thinking, I did it again. I grabbed my machine gun and I, I shoved myself over the side of a mountain. This time, I'm airborne and it was, the fall is like 80 feet. And I just do this belly flop and I slam on the ground, splat into this puddle of water. And um, immediately, I, uh, I clutch my right hand to make sure I'm holding on, still holding on to my machine gun. And I could feel my rucksack with all my ammo resting perfectly in my lower back and it's just it just there's no encouragement to move but the water um, it, it's cooling my burning thigh and I just I just wanted to lay there I just wanted to fall asleep but the moment I thought of sleeping it the idea terrified me because I knew if I fell asleep I might not ever wake up again so I, I, uh, I lifted my left hand and I started waving in the air like SOS flag. But I, I was so, t uh, so tired and um, I kept my face in the mud. I kept my face in the dirt and I just kept waving my arm hoping for someone to see me. Um, maybe five, ten minutes went by and finally um, someone spotted me. And uh, a group of my guys ran up to me and they started working on freeing me from my equipment. Someone grabbed my machine gun, somebody grabbed my rock. And by then, I'm feeling drunk, you know? I, I know uh, I know my guys are there and they're helping me out, but I just remember just feeling like hands working on my body. And then, I, and, then I, and then my body's tumbling and somehow I'm rolling down this little small hill and I land in a stream of water. And it's funny, but somehow uh, I remember and I, and, I, and I realized that no one's doing anything, you know? One moment everyone's working on, you know, trying to save me. And then next moment, everyone's just staring at me as my body just laying there lifeless in the water. I think everyone was kind of a bit in shock because uh, I've always been such a PT stud. Uh, I've always been the fastest, if not one of the fastest guys in the company. I've always maxed out my push-up with sit-ups. So I guess to see me laying there lifeless was a real shocker. But uh, somebody snapped out of it, and, and before I know it, uh, someone was grabbing me by, by, my, by my gear, uh, my collar, and just dragging me across the earth towards the gun truck. Towards the gun truck. Uh, that person was my squad leader, and uh, whatever pain I was feeling in my leg, the, all that pain started focusing on my chest and my neck as gravel and rocks and dirt was scraping my chest and my face. Um, as painful as that was, I was actually really happy because I remember thinking, like, I am now literally in the hands of my, my teammates uh, and my guys. I know they're not going to let me die. So uh, my squad leader managed to drag me to the gun truck, and now there's still combatants in the area, and he needs me on my feet, and he can't lift me on his own. So somehow I find the, the strength to stand up on both feet, even though I'm shot in my leg even though I didn't know I, was, I wasn't certain I was shot, but I was shot in my leg. And I don't know how I didn't black out, but I stood up on my leg and I crawled into the gun truck. He's unconscious, he's still responding verbally. <laughs> Thank you.
They, uh, they rush me on base and they get me inside our uh, medical tent. And then there, things really started, um, my, my memory started really started going in and out. My, I remember my body felt really cold. I wasn't shivering, but I was, I was cold. And my mind started going in and out like a really bad radio signal. Um, they couldn't find an exit wounds, but they, my leg was swollen. So they knew there was damage going on in there and they found a small entry wound in my left cheek. So they assumed it was just shrapnel. Um, and then within five to 10 minutes, we had a bird arrive on the cop. And um, I remember them getting me on a stretcher. Um, they had a, one of those insulator things on around, wrapped around me, trying to keep me warm. And as they were carrying me to the bird, everybody was telling me, Terry, you gotta stay awake, you gotta stay awake. And I, I could understand why I needed to stay awake but I was just so tired and I was so cold. And um, the moment that the sunlight hit my skin, it really felt euphoric. It felt like a drug. It felt so nice to be warm. It, and um, you know that feeling when you're watching a movie and it's really late at night and you really wanna watch the film, but you're, you're really sleepy, you're feeling drowsy, and you drift off to sleep. Well, that's how I felt for me. Um, I knew I could have held on, but the, the sun felt so nice and I was just so fucking tired. I remember just deciding to release my grip in reality. And I didn't wake up until later uh, in a forward hospital in country. I remember seeing the battalion commander there and uh, I remember trying to give him a situation report and then looking over and seeing three nurses in full scrubs. Um, they had the saddest look in their eyes for me. I, uh, I remember staring at their faces, looking for an explanation, and um, they they couldn't look at me. They uh, they looked away, and I put my head down. And when I woke up, I was in Germany. I didn't wake up until two days later. I remember waking up, and it wasn't like one of those groggy morning Sunday mornings when you know you're rubbing your eyes and you're kind of stretching. It was um. It was instantaneous. My eyes snapped open. Um, I wasn't freaked out. I knew I was in the hospital. I knew I was injured. But what did freak me out was I realized was I had this a tube jammed down my throat and I grabbed it uh, reactively and I started pulling on it. I started tugging and um, dark purple bitter goo started oozing out of my mouth. And when I started gurgling, uh, there was a nurse in the room who rushed over, who heard my gurgles, and she called me down. She let me know, know it was a feeding tube, which made sense and calmed me down. Uh, the doctors came in and uh, informed me multiple times that I was a very lucky young man. He said, um, he said that had I arrived any more than two minutes, I would have bled out to death. In fact, I needed blood so quickly that they gave me untreated blood and had to test my blood for an entire year uh, to make sure you know, I didn't have, there was any STDs or HIV or anything like that, which there isn't, I, I don't have. And um, he also told me that the round had hit me at one of the only few or only angles where I was able to keep my hip. Any other angle, he said it would have been game over. Um, I was transported to Walter Reed Army Medical Center I spent 10 months there rehabilitating and undergoing 12 surgeries. Um, currently, I can't run and I'll never run again. Essentially what happened was the round had entered my left cheek and into my thigh and hit my bone. When it hit my bone, it exploded and it essentially became a mini grenade. Shrapnel came this way and shrapnel came this way. Uh, a piece of shrapnel took out a chunk of my, the ball of my head and my femur. So if this is my femur and this is the head, which is inside my hip, it's missing a chunk. So if I were to run, it would just demolish my hip, the, the ball of my hip and turn into chalk dust. So um, I can't ever run again. And uh, eventually I will need a new hip. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Um, but I'm just happy to be alive. Like I said, uh, I like to focus on the positive. It, I mean, it took a while for me to find the positive. 
uh, Walter Reed was um, probably one of the, was the worst experience of my life. I mean, I'm so thankful for the doctors, the nurses, and what they did, but um, it was really hard, not just physically, but emotionally. I mean, I wanted to make the infantry a career and uh, take away my ability to run, took away my chances with uh, doing that, making the infantry a career. Um, but I'm happy to be alive, obviously, and coming so close to death just gave me such, such massive perspective. I mean, there's been days where I've been sad and uh, instantly I could just transport myself back to that exact location in Afghanistan, back to that place and time where I was lying there just waiting to die. And life isn't that bad. I mean, I really shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here making this video. I shouldn't be um, doing the things that I do. I should be six feet under right now. I know that and I'm just grateful to be alive. Eventually, I did make it to Peru and I did get to volunteer with Global Tears. Uh, I got to travel the world some more. I even did Ironman, not running. I did, uh, did, I did the run with crutches. And I'm actually training for another Ironman, a double Ironman. But I guess that's another story.